Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everybody joining us today. On behalf of USAID and AgriLinks, I want to welcome you to our theme month webinar on what works to improve women farmers' income, a presentation of the USAID Improved Activity Cost Effectiveness Review. I'm Catherine Doyle with AgriLinks, and we are delighted to have so many of you and counting with us today. Before we begin, let me orient you to the Zoom platform. On the bottom of your screen, you will see most of your controls. First, please use the chat to introduce yourself and tell us where you're joining us from. To ask questions throughout the webinar, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Towards the end of today's presentation, we will have time for a Q&A portion where our speakers will answer some of the questions you have asked in the Q&A. Depending on how much time we do have for the Q&A and how many questions we receive, we may also address remaining questions in a follow-up post on AgriLinks, so stay tuned. As a reminder, we are recording this webinar and we'll email you the post-event resources shortly following the event. And you'll also be able to find the resources on agrilinks.org. Now I have the pleasure of introducing our three speakers. Dean Carlin joined USAID as Chief Economist in November 2022. In addition to serving as Chief Economist, he is also the Frederick S. Nemers Distinguished Professor of Economics and Finance at Northwestern University and co-director of the Global Poverty Research Lab at Northwestern University. He is the founder of Innovations for Poverty Action, IPA, a nonprofit dedicated to discovering and promoting solutions to global poverty problems. Caitlin Tulak is the Deputy Office Director and Team Lead for Evidence Use in USAID's Office of the Chief Economist. She was a founding member of the JPAL policy team, then worked at the International Rescue Committee for eight years, where she established a team responsible for studying and improving the cost effectiveness of IRC programs. And finally, Osley Kess is the Senior Gender Advisor at USAID's Bureau for Resilience, Environment, and Food Security. She is a development economist and a gender expert with 20 years of experience working on policy and programs to advance gender equality and women's economic empowerment in low and middle income countries. Again, thank you very much to our audience for attending. I'll now pass it to Dean, Agency Chief Economist for USAID. Great. Hi, everybody. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here with everybody. I see there's a great, um, great crowd from around the world. So welcome, and we look forward to this conversation. Um, so let me start with a bit about who I am and why I'm excited to be here with everybody. My name is Dean Carlin, and I'm the agency chief economist, a role I began in November 2022. I still wear my other hat as a professor of economics at Northwestern University. I'm an applied microeconomist, and I focused my career on using experimental methods and behavioral economics insights to understand what interventions are relatively better at delivering more impact per dollar than others and why. My research, which has spanned more than 80 randomized evaluations in about 25 countries, has always been centered on partnerships, partnerships with international and local NGOs, government, local researchers, and the private sector. Those 80 are just a small proportion of the overall set of randomized evaluations that the development economics community has produced in the past 20 years that can and should be used to inform key donor and policymaker decisions. Supporting the use of this evidence is one of the big motivations of my joining USAID and a big focus of the Office of the Chief Economist, as you'll hear. Um, so, so given that background, what am I here to talk to you about today? I'm gonna to start by introducing the Office of the Chief Economist and the concept of cost effectiveness, which is central to much of our work. I'm then gonna talk for a moment about why gender equality is so important for productivity. And I'm gonna start with my own home discipline of economics to give you an example, but also um, in agriculture. I'll share a few evidence-based principles of cost effectiveness design of programs to increase women's agricultural income, and then hand it over to my colleague, Caitlin Tullock, who is going to walk you through the process and results of the cost effectiveness review that we conducted on gender and agriculture. We'll close with a moderated Q&A facilitated by our close collaborator on this, Asli Kess. Uh, 
So the, the Office of the Chief Economist has a mission. Um, at the, 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 the mission of the Office of the Chief Economist is to support the agency in improving the effectiveness of our programming and broader global engagement by bringing strong economic theory, evidence, and tools to bear on USAID's work across all sectors. We have four strategic objectives. The first is evidence use, and the second is evidence generation. With both of these, our focus is not on the entire universe of evidence, which is broadly defined at, at USAID. Instead, we're specifically focused on cost effectiveness evidence, and that's what we'll continue talking about today. Our third strategic objective, which we won't discuss in this series, is on macroeconomic policy engagement. And fourth, as a cross-cutting enabler of the first three strategic objectives, we are working to revitalize the economics and evidence workforce within USAID. So why in the Office of the Chief Economist, OCE, do we care so much about cost effectiveness and want to support the agency in using this lens more? This chart, which looks at the cost effectiveness of various global livelihood interventions in terms of a common measure, says it all. Even among effective interventions, there can be orders of magnitude difference in the in how much each how, how much impact each intervention delivers per dollar. We look to evidence from impact evaluations to understand the impact side of cost effectiveness. Central to this understanding of impact, in quotes, is the counterfactual. What would have happened in the absence of the program without a counterfactual we risk overestimating or underestimating the impacts of our activities. Let's consider an agricultural program. This data is taken, these data are taken from an evaluation done of a Feed the Future program, which distributed cash transfers in Nigeria. Let's say the implementing party implements and measures women's participation in non-farm enterprises at baseline throughout and after the program. If we simply look at the percentage of women engaged in non-farm enterprises before and after the program, then this is the impact we would assume. Um, sorry, there we go. Right, but maybe women's if we sorry wrong spot. <laughs> there we go. But maybe women's off-farm work has steadily it was steadily improving in this region, regardless of USAID's programming. That's the blue line, the counterfactual. Even if USAID had not run the cash transfer program, women's off-farm work would have increased. So our program still had an impact, but it's smaller than what we assumed without the counterfactual. The right answer is that smaller, we can borrow the 13 percentage points. When you add in cost to the results from impact evaluations, a lot of people think that we're talking about doing cost benefit analysis. Cost benefit and cost effectiveness are actually different from another in a way that's really important to us. And I wanna talk about why we're focusing on using cost effectiveness evidence and analysis for these types of decisions. Cost benefit analysis allows you to compare interventions across sectors, across outcomes. This can be helpful when interventions have impacts across sectors, but Doing cost-benefit analysis requires some big and bold assumptions in order to monetize those different impacts. In particular, it relies on assumptions about the dollar value of different outcomes. For example, how many years of education would be worth 100 human trafficking cases averted? How much more income for farmers would be worth treating 100 malaria cases or averting 100 cases of intimate partner violence? Critically, cost-benefit analysis is used to decide how much to spend on education versus health versus agriculture, but that is not the question we are trying to address. And it, is, it unnecessarily turns this conversation into turf protection rather than what we want it to be, which is a collaborative exercise to help groups, whether missions or technical bureaus or implementing parties, move the needle as much as they can on the priority that they choose. Cost effectiveness analysis has just that focus. It accepts the objectives of a program, for instance, improving women's control of income, as is, and asks the question, which intervention makes the most progress on this outcome per dollar spent? Cost effectiveness analysis helps us consider different programming options in a way that I think is quite powerful. So there's, oops, sorry. Um, so th there's really two distinct ways of approaching this issue of cost effectiveness. First, you can make forward-looking assessments of how much impact per dollar an intervention is likely to have. For these forward-looking assessments, we rely on existing evaluation evidence, 
from around the world about the intervention or interventions that we are considering. This is what I'm calling evidence use. But of course, sometimes when looking for useful cost-effectiveness evidence, we're not satisfied. We do not feel confident in what the evidence is telling us from around the world. Perhaps the evidence is scant. Perhaps it is from contexts that are particular, different in particularly important ways. This leads to the second way of considering cost-effectiveness evidence as an evidence generation exercise, one that aims to fill these kinds of gaps in the global body of knowledge. In such cases, USAID can directly estimate the actual cost-effectiveness of an intervention that it funds, and in so doing, learn your impact while also contributing to that global body of knowledge so that others can learn from you, including yourself in the future. Um, so when people hear about the Office of the Chief Economist, they often assume we're focused on evidence generation, and that's not the case. We're focused on both evidence use and, as well as evidence generation. So let's dive deeper into evidence use. There are something like 4,000 randomized trials done across development, which can inform our assessment of how cost-effective different interventions are likely to be. That's pretty exciting. When I started working in this field many years ago, there were only a few RCTs. We've learned a tremendous amount. And it's really this body of knowledge, this body of evidence that we want to be using, not just cherry picking individual studies, it's the body of evidence. When we look across multiple evaluations of interventions, all aiming to achieve a particular outcome, we get a sense of which of those interventions tend to have the greatest impact per dollar spent. This is tremendously useful information to tell us which interventions and approaches we might want to include in our activity design, solicitation materials, et cetera. But just because it's tremendously useful doesn't mean that we think cost effectiveness is the only thing worth considering. Responsibly doing evidence use necessarily means combining that evidence of cost effectiveness with local information and other forms of knowledge to arrive at decisions. This is likely to include needs assessments, community consultations to understand the context better, institutional assessments, et cetera. So how do we go about assessing which interventions tend to be particularly cost-effective at achieving certain outcomes for certain populations? In practice, we are pulling together the studies which look at interventions aiming to Im improve a particular outcome among a particular population. From one of our first cost-effectiveness reviews, we looked at interventions aiming to improve the agricultural income specifically of women farmers in developing countries. Pulling together estimates of impact along with, along with the costs where we can get them, we then group the interventions based on two dimensions. First, the x-axis separates interventions by their comparative cost-effectiveness. That is, how much impact per dollar does that intervention typically achieve across all the studies available to us? Second, the y-axis, we categorize interventions by how much uncertainty there will be when trying to apply the existing evidence to a new context. You may lack confidence because there are few studies or because the studies show highly varied outcomes or because the studies show tremendous sensitivity to local contextual factors that are difficult to observe. For whatever reason or combination of reasons, the existing evidence gives less guidance sometimes than others. And the rows in this two by two signal that the top row being the ones where we have more confidence and bottom row being the ones where we lack confidence. So let's start with the easy one. So sometimes we come across interventions for which we have a lot of good cost effectiveness evidence, which consistently show that the intervention performs well or tells us exactly the context in which it'll work. And then we can deem that a good buy. This is what we would call, this is what we call a good buy. And we hope that USAID staff start to think of these as a default or a starting point for possible activity designs. Start with the good buy. If you can beat it, great, but at the very least, let's do that. So as I said above, the good buy designation doesn't mean an approach should be copied and pasted cookie cutter style into a new context, but it's probably worth a closer look to see if it could fit and be a starting point and a default option. On the other hand, sometimes we see an intervention for which we have a lot of good cost effectiveness data, which consistently shows that the intervention is not delivering high impact per dollar relative to alternatives. In some cases, we see zero effectiveness again and again across many contexts. This is what we would call, unfortunately, a bad buy. And we're hoping that USAID staff avoid these kinds of interventions or treat them as an extremely risky proposition if we always had the evidence, evidence to designate interventions as good or bad buys, our, jobs, our, our job at, at OCE would be pretty straightforward. But of course, that's not the case. Sometimes we see interventions which are doing well, 
on comparative cost effectiveness, but where the number of available studies is low or there's some variation in cost effectiveness, we just, we don't understand yet. It works really well in some places, not as well in others, and we don't understand why. This would also be where we tend to put innovative new approaches, which have good theories of change, but which haven't yet been tested with impact evaluations. These are what we call promising buys. And this designation means that they are potentially worth trying, but also that this is a case where further cost effectiveness evidence is especially valuable. The key point is that this categorization isn't static. If you feel strongly enough to want to invest in a promising buy, then we think it may be worth funding an impact evaluation that allows everyone to learn from that experience and improve our confidence in assessments of future cost effectiveness. And lastly, of course, we have interventions which are not doing terribly well on their comparative cost effectiveness, but where we're not yet confident enough to designate them as bad buys. Again, this could be because we've only have a few studies or available studies took place in a very narrow range of contexts. And so these are our unpromising buys. And this categorization means just what it says. The intervention doesn't seem that promising relative to alternatives, but the evidence is light. So if you decide to fund this intervention, again, it's a case where more evaluation would be helpful. So at its core, this is our framework for making the assessments of future cost effectiveness I've been referring to. The body of global cost effectiveness evidence can help us categorize interventions based on how cost effective interventions seem to be for a particular outcome, but also based on how confident we are in that assessment. So it's a guide for evidence use, but it also is then providing some insight into when to engage in evidence generation activity. But of course, thinking about good and bad and promising and unpromising buys, that's only the first step in the process. The idea is that we look for the intervention with the highest average cost effectiveness and apply that approach cookie cutter style. Sorry, I think I misspoke. The idea isn't <laughs> that we look for the intervention with the highest average cost effectiveness and apply that approach cookie cutter style around the world. We can also use those studies alongside other knowledge to think about how to apply global evidence in a particular context. Those same studies, um, which told you about the cost effectiveness of that intervention in the past, also probably have some information on why the program was successful or not, why the costs were higher or lower. So our hope is that people can be starting with a good or promising buy, but then asking themselves, are the local conditions in my context similar to those in the places where this has been evaluated? Am I facing similar problems, targeting similar populations? What is the general lesson on human behavior that comes from this body of studies? Do I think that mechanism for change applies here? And lastly, what did it actually look like to implement this good or promising program in the context in which it has been studied? Do those same conditions for successful implementation exist here? Is there the necessary capacity, infrastructure, or skills to make it work in the way that it did in the previous studies? To sum up, using cost effectiveness isn't the end of a conversation about program design, but it should be the start of one. Okay, so now let's turn to the topic of the rest of today's webinar, gender equity and empowerment. Here's a problem statement to kick us off. Women have immense potential to make the entire world more prosperous, yet despite decades of progress, that potential is yet to be fully realized. Feel free to put a guess. Who, who said that in, into, the, into the chat? I'll pause for just a second. So the answer is Claudia Golden. She was the winner of the Nobel Prize in Economics last year in 2023, and only the third female to win. The audience may not know it, but gender equity and empowerment of women scholars is a big topic of discussion in my home discipline, economics and academia. Over many decades, women reaching heights of the econ profession, both, both low and flat. This, this graph here on, that I've shared um, shows the proportion of women over time that enter PhD and how they enter PhD programs at lower rates, get promoted less often, are less productive in terms of in terms of papers produced and citations in an academic that's what I mean by in an academic sense um, than their male peers. It's a pressing problem intrinsically first because it suggests that women who want to go into the field of economics face barriers to engaging fully. And second, in a more instrumental way, the quality of our aggregate output is undoubtedly worse because research, whether we like it or not, is informed by our unique, unique perspectives and experiences as researchers, 
And thus narrowing the set of researchers inevitably means narrowing the lessons learned. This issue has received a lot of attention in economics in recent years, and economists have applied our own research toolkit to evaluating different approaches to improving gender equity and empowerment in economics. I want to give you some examples, and these are actually um, exactly the kind of thinking that we want to apply in the agriculture space within USAID. So a study with undergraduate students in the United States randomly assigned incoming underrepresented minorities entering their first year of college to one of three groups a welcome treatment that included two emails encouraging them to consider economics courses, a welcome plus information treatment that also included information showcasing the diversity of researchers and topics in economics, and a control group that received no extra email. Both email treatments increased enrollment in economics courses, with the one that emphasized diversity being the strongest, raising economics course completion by nearly 20%. The wonderful example of using a short run randomized controlled trial to optimize basic take up of something we think is important. In this case, getting women into the pipeline of the economics profession. But also you might ask, is access enough? From that graph I showed you, we've been getting women into courses for a while, but clearly a lot of other obstacles get in the way of advancement and success. Another study randomly assigned slots of the oversubscribed American Economic Association annual mentoring workshop. They found that women who participated in the workshop had 26% more publications and 45% higher citations than women who did not get slots. This is a really exciting finding because it's actually getting at women's full participation in the discipline when they are supported by senior mentors. They collaborate more with others, produce more papers, and have work cited more often. I just learned last night at dinner, in fact, that this research directly led to the reallocation of millions of dollars towards expanding this program within the AA. So that's the kind of evidence-based allocation of resources that we love to hear about in economists taking, taking their tools seriously for themselves. So it, this exemplifies the kind of approach that I think is necessary, using evaluations and careful quality data to inform critical decisions, helping us move the needle on important issues like improving women's equity and empowerment. So my point in telling you this is twofold. First, to reiterate that achieving gender equity and women's empowerment is important intrinsically to empower women and instrumentally because of the rich contributions women can make to our collective achievement. It would be easy to get excited about gender transformation. We have heard so far and will continue to hear how critical this issue is both to women and others who participate in agri-food systems in which they participate. But we have to be clear-eyed about the fact that some things work much, much better than others at achieving transformative change. So secondly, I want to note that women's full participation and empowerment is hard. Simply including women, caring about empowerment, is an important start, but it's not enough. Merely wanting something to work is not enough. I even wrote a book once titled More Than Good Intentions. This challenge is a prime example of the thesis of that book. But with good evaluations and careful analysis, we can find ways forward, ways that do work. So given the importance of this topic and the availability of a growing body of evidence to support decision-making, OCE last year embarked on an improved activity cost effectiveness, we call it impact review, with partners in the Bureau for Resilience, Environment and Food Security, REFS, as well as colleagues in the IPI Gender Equality and Women's Empowerment Hub. So I'm gonna hand over to my colleague, Caitlin Tullock, who led that review to share it with us. All right, and Dean, it looks like you need to stop sharing. Great, I will start sharing mine now. All right, well, thank you so much, everyone. Um, I'm really pleased and excited to be here and sharing this piece of work um, with this community. I wanna quickly check because I'm not sure whether you are seeing my screen or not. Yes, we are, Caitlin. Great. All right. Thank you so much. All right. My name is Caitlin Tullock. Sorry, I Caitlin. The... We were seeing it. It is um, your screen isn't sharing anymore. Oh, how strange. Yeah, right. we were seeing so the sorry. presenter version. Ah, okay. Let me fix this. 
All right, it's telling me that you are seeing my screen, so I'm going to yes, hope perfect. that that is accurate. All right. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, sorry for the technical snafu, but uh, I'm really excited to be here and sharing this piece of work uh, with this community. My name is Caitlin Tulloch. I'm the evidence use lead in the office of the chief economist, and I was privileged to get to work with colleagues in REFS and GenDev, as Dean mentioned, on this first of our improved activity cost effectiveness reviews, impact reviews, as we are calling them. Um, so as Dean mentioned, one of the really core elements of doing this kind of assessment of potential cost effectiveness of different interventions is selecting a particular outcome that we think is really important and important enough to be kind of mapping potential progress towards it and using that as the basis for thinking about different interventions. Um, in this case, I'm sorry, this is showing me, yes. Um, in this case, the ideal outcome measure that we're really interested in, um, and this is informed by conversations with colleagues around USAID, is uh, the profit or really the net revenue of women farmers in low and middle income countries. When we started the review, I think we were, we were talking in terms of women's productivity. And as we began reading more, and certainly I began learning more, it was clear that as an agronomic measure, that's a, a very precisely defined thing. But actually revenue and profit is a little more relevant for what we were focusing on in this case because it both captures changes in the kind of cultivation and productivity across multiple crops and the potential for women shifting which crops they're growing in response to interventions. And if that's a part of improving women's income and increasing their participation in agri-food systems, then we'd wanna be able to capture that in our outcome measures. Another important lesson is that we really want to make sure we're not only capturing growth in revenue, for instance, but also uh, taking into account the costs that women face in adopting new technologies. And so wherever possible, we would like to focus not only on revenue, but really on profits to account for the costs of using any new techniques or inputs. Um, so that gets us, I mean, maybe it's not surprising. I'm an economist. I'm going to end up thinking about, you know, how, how people are maximizing the profit that they, uh, they receive. But one of the really interesting lessons also from the studies I'm going to show you as this presentation continues is that um, measuring kind of profit alone, measuring in dollars is not necessarily sufficient if women are not controlling the resources that they produce. This might be the case where women are working in joint cultivation with male partners, or even in cases where they're working on self-managed plots, but as part of a, a larger household. And so if we really want to get at this core question that, uh, that was put to us and that we kind of teased out working with colleagues, we'd like to capture both the amount of profit or kind of net revenue um, that's being produced, but also influence on decisions about income. And this is our definition. This is the outcome and the North Star of this analysis that I'm going to present to you now. It's twofold. On the one hand, this dollar value of, you know, kind of profits and income, but on the other hand, measures of control and decision making that allow women to actually dispose of those resources in ways that are meaningful to them. I do want to note, um, I, the, the literature on this has really grown and improved in recent years. There were a number of really wonderful studies kind of reporting on both of these things. Um, but in some cases, we didn't have kind of good and robust measures of revenue or profits, but there were still studies reporting what I would call proximate outcomes. This would be things like yields or technology adoption, which are one step in that pathway towards improved income or control of income, but not tracing all the way through. And so we've also recorded, and in some cases informed our decision-making based on these proximate outcomes, because they let us think about the plausibility of impacts on those downstream measures like agricultural profit or revenue. So for the rest of this presentation, when I'm talking about effectiveness and effects, this is what I'm really referring to kind of profits or net revenue of women farmers, as well as a measure of influence on decisions about that income for women in women headed or joint households. 
And what you see um, when you begin reading these studies and, and kind of looking in this field, I'm sure this is quite familiar to folks on this call, is the many, many constraints that women farmers face in earning and controlling income. And actually one of the, the kind of geneses for this study was the report put out by the FAO last year on the status of women in agri-food systems that did an excellent job tracing a number of these constraints. So on the one hand, women may have greater care obligations uh, or restrictions on their labor and mobility that make it more difficult for them to invest in their agricultural production. Um, it's also often, not universally, but uh, often customary for men to own land or to have um, kind of first right in terms of using land and women may lack equal titling that both prevents their use, but also potentially prevents making productive investments that could improve yields and income from land that they're working. Women may have more difficulty borrowing and saving to finance investments, um, you know, improved equipment, inputs, techniques on that land in a way that lowers their income. And lastly, women may have lower access to training, information about the market, but even social networks through which information passes that could help inform cultivation decisions. And so for all of these reasons together, you can trace, you know, there's a huge body of literature on the lower yields and the lower income that women farmers experience compared to their male counterparts. One interesting point though, in returning to this issue of control of income is that even if we solved all of these problems, even if you know, women's technical productivity was identical to, to that of men, there are still more barriers in between that and women controlling the resources that they produce in the way that I think is, is the focus or the, one of the interests of, of this project. Household norms may prevent women from controlling income that they help earn, which is why we included that second outcome measure in this whole review. And that is yet another barrier to that lowers women's effective income, control of income um, in agri-food systems. So that's a lot of constraints. It's not the most complicated uh, flow chart I've ever put up, but, but it's a lot of different things standing in the way. And on the flip side of that, there are a large number of different approaches to addressing these constraints um, that programs can look to if they're seeking to improve the income of, uh, of women farmers. You may have uh, interventions addressing these labor constraints. Uh, as a mother of a five-year-old, I was really excited to read an excellent study on uh, community-based childcare centers, simply to give women time uh, and, and mental space to be working on, uh, on cultivation. There's also some that are attacking this through the direction of norms, things like positive masculinity interventions that seek to improve the balance of gendered obligations and duties within a household. You've got interventions that are seeking to kind of more equalize title and, uh, and access to land. So formalizing women's land rights or co-titling pushes. A number of interventions that are addressing these constraints in terms of investments. So subsidizing or financing what I'll call business as usual inputs and equipment. You can see some programs that are doing kind of lump sum productive grants for rural households and so forth. And also a number of interventions that are seeking to kind of fill information gaps or connect women to networks. So this would be including women in um, ag extension, often including um, through ICT or using women female farm advisors to deliver ag extension. And then lastly, and maybe going into this, I might not have thought of this as, a, as an ag intervention, but there's a class of, of programs that are looking to directly push on women's power in intra-household decision-making, such that in addition to all of these other constraints, women's control of the income that they earn through cultivation um, is higher than it would have been otherwise. So this is the universe of interventions that we're going to be talking about. And as we mentioned earlier, the, the yardstick, the, the outcome that we're measuring against is progress on women's agricultural income and control of income. All right, so how did we actually go about that? And the answer, um, and maybe this is not surprising for anyone I've ever met before, the answer is a very large spreadsheet um, in which we're capturing a lot of info from studies that measure the impact, these are the impact evaluations that Dean was referring to, measure the impact of these interventions against those outcomes. 
So we are taking a study and firstly, we are tagging it based on what interventions did it evaluate. But beyond that, we don't want to know just where to categorize it. There's a lot of interesting detail in these studies on what exactly was delivered. What does it look like to provide this type of program for which we have an impact estimate? We also track what populations were reached in this particular study. There's huge variety in what it means to be a women farmer. Um, and I think a lot of the older studies really focused on women headed households as the definition, but that's, that's quite a different population than women in male headed households, women engaged in joint cultivation. You also potentially see differences based on the type of crops women are growing. So are they engaged in cash crop cultivation or staple crop cultivation? We're trying to track all of that information. Wherever humanly possible, um, we are capturing what the interventions cost to deliver in order to inform that assessment of cost effectiveness. And then of course, pulling in the information on what impact did this intervention have on the outcome measures that I care about. So first step in this process is gathering the studies and, uh, and coding all of this information that links these interventions to the set of outcomes that we care about. And then we're using that data to assign these nine interventions into those four categories that Dean mentioned earlier. And I just wanna reiterate the, the basis for this assessment, which I'll then walk through on a, an intervention by intervention basis. But we care not only about the comparative cost effectiveness, the impact or impact per dollar that these uh, interventions are having. But from this body of evidence, we, we found about 30 studies in total, which had about 40 um, effect size estimates when you take multiple treatment arms into account. From that kind of set of 40 rows in my big spreadsheet, what we're trying to also get at is how confident are we if we were estimating or extrapolating the potential cost effectiveness of that intervention in a new context. And so those are the two dimensions of our categorization here that lead us to put interventions into each of these categories. All right, I'm gonna stop burying the lead and I'm gonna uh, jump in and start telling you about what the findings of this review were. They're also available in the report, which is up on the AgriLinks website. All right, so goodbyes. And a reminder, this is interventions where evidence suggests that they are highly cost-effective. And also we have high confidence that that extrapolates or that applies across a number of contexts. Somewhat surprisingly, actually, um, providing lump sum cash, what you can think of as maybe um, unrestricted household grants targeting women farmers, emerged as one of the stronger you know, good buys from this review. Uh, and amusingly, it wasn't even on our initial list of interventions, um, but colleagues at the World Bank Gender Innovation Lab reminded us of the number of interesting studies on this. And when you take the six impact estimates available that from across three different countries, what you see from these unconditional household grants, and this is not social protection cash with long-term streams of smaller, um, smaller amounts, but lump sum larger amounts that you can think of as a grant, um, you see really large impacts on household income. And this is measured long after these programs have ended. So we're not just picking up on the fact that we gave people cash and then they spent the cash. Um, but actually what you see in a number of these studies is improvements in investment, in labor force participation that helps explain how household income would be sustainably increased thanks to this kind of unconditional grant. Another interesting finding was that some, though definitely not all of these studies, documented some improvement in women's influence over household income and spending on the basis of this grant. And that's not necessarily what I might have expected going in, but I suppose if you think about this in terms of women receiving a, a productive asset, this um, cash that they can spend as they choose, it could be the case that that, um, that increases their effective control of income subsequently. Though, as I say, this is not the strongest finding about the cash programs and probably a great subject for future research. So the conclusion here is that, you know, these kind of unconditional grants are a simple, efficient, I might say hard to screw up 
way to address one really key constraint that women farmers often face. But you'll remember that my map of all of the constraints was quite complicated. There were a lot of them. And so depending on norms about entrepreneurship or gender roles in a particular context, we don't want to suggest that, you know, this is a, a panacea and is going to fix everything. It is surprisingly effective and it's, it's hard to screw up, as I said, but it may be a really good candidate for bundling with other interventions that address those norms and unlock the ways in which women can be investing uh, as they choose to increase their income. All right, let's turn now to the promising buys. And a reminder, these are the interventions where inter uh, evidence suggests they are quite cost effective, but we're less confident um, that that's going to extrapolate across contexts. And that can be for a variety of reasons. We'll take them on a case-by-case -case basis. Firstly um, is what's probably quite a familiar intervention and program to many of you, the formalization of women's land rights and co-titling. And this is a relevant program because in many contexts, formal demarcation and registration is infrequent and women are less likely simply than men to have kind of title uh, to the land that they're working on. And co-titling can be fairly easily done, it seems, as part of wider pushes on land registration and titling. We found three studies on this topic, um, and two of those three available studies found improvements in yields, income, or profits when women were co-titled with men. One really interesting thing from these studies um, that, that jumped out to me is that in practice, they achieved high take-up of co-titling with pretty basic provision of information or very small incentives. It wasn't necessary to do a massive norms shift campaign in order to achieve high take up of co-titling with women. It doesn't appear that deeply, deeply entrenched norms were the barrier to making that happen if you simply go out and, and do a registration and a co-titling campaign. So that's, I think, uh, a promising finding. It suggests that this can be done again in a pretty straightforward way and that it is linked. This is maybe not surprising for anyone who's taken an ag econ course. It is linked with, uh, you know, improvements in yields, income, and profits. But the other thing that emerges from these studies is that the mechanisms at work here, you know, changes in labor patterns and investment on different pieces of land, likely takes years and years to occur. And there's one of these three studies where we're still waiting for longer term follow up results that would be on a time period we think would capture the full scope of impacts that you, you would expect or hope to see from this kind of intervention. So we would want people to think about, you know, kind of co-titling, formalizing women's land rights. It's probably, I would almost call it a, a no regrets policy if it can be done you know, in such a straightforward manner and, and for very basic equity reasons, this makes sense. But it's unlikely to be kind of immediately transformative and immediately or uniquely contributing to big, big growth in income. It's one part of a really useful package, but it's gonna be one of the parts that takes longer to achieve change. Oh, someone said something. No, okay, I'll keep going. All right, the next of our promising buys is looking at subsidies or finance for what I'm gonna call gender adapted inputs and equipment. And when I'm talking about inputs and equipment here, um, I mean things like um, small scale water pumps or improved varieties and seeds. Uh, I can broadly call these kind of new agricultural technologies in a really general sense. Um, and you see a large number of programs that encourage adoption of these new technologies um, through subsidies, through finance. Sometimes that's a 100% subsidy, which is to say, giving the thing away for free. Um, and when we look at programs that are encouraging adoption of specifically gender adapted inputs and equipment, um, that example, I think, you know, small scale water pumps in Kenya was a really nice one. This is a context where women are responsible for water collection in many cases. And this water pump was given directly to women. They had access to water sources that may, uh, made it significantly easier for them to do that job. We can see significantly better results for women's income. 
Um, and in three out of four impact estimates available to us, there were large, sometimes, increases in revenue and profits. The challenge here that I hope you're asking yourselves is, well, what, what makes something gender adapted as compared to any other agricultural technology walking down the street? And as we tried to kind of parse this out, um, and you'll see at a later point where we look at business as usual, inputs and equipment, and we need to create a distinction here. There were three criteria that we could discern that seemed to be responsible for kind of high, uh, high impacts of these particular programs. And those three are firstly, uh, returns to that new technology. Again, using that in a, an economic sense to refer to the new technique or equipment or whatever. Returns to that technology can't depend on complementary inputs that women may not have. So for instance, if I'm giving you a new varietal of rice, but that rice requires a huge amount of additional water compared to what the, the usual variety was that you used, it wouldn't meet this criteria. Similarly, um, new technologies, techniques, equipment can't require significant extra allocation of women's time or other labor. If that's the case, they're unlikely to be successful because as we saw above, women face particular constraints on use of their own labor or activation of kind of household and other labor. And lastly, use of that new technology, that new technique, input, whatever, can't violate norms about women's mobility or appropriate work. If you give you know, a woman something, it's an interesting study on oxen um, later on, that's potentially quite relevant for them, but it would require them to uh, travel significant difference, distances or use heavy equipment. It may simply not be feasible to implement in that context, and that would show up then in the returns that women would get. So given that we've got you know, three or four impact estimates showing large increases, why is this counted as a promising and not a good buy? And I think this is a really important point referring to um, this issue of our confidence, of how certain are we that we can kind of extrapolate this finding across different contexts or programs. And the challenge here, one we've continued discussing with colleagues in the Center for Ag and, and others, is that it's really difficult to know ex ante whether a particular um, technology, input, equipment that we were looking at was likely to be sufficiently gender adapted to ultimately drive this kind of increase in income and profits for women farmers. And in a moment, I'm gonna show you a much larger category called subsidizing and financing business as usual inputs and equipment where we're not seeing results. And so this I think is a really critical area for future research, understanding better what are the characteristics that make a new agricultural technology or technique or whatever sufficiently relevant, standalone, feasible for women farmers, that these other constraints don't get in the way of achieving growth in income, growth in profits for them. And that is why this is rated as promising rather than a good buy, is that we still really need a lot to do a lot of work in order to have confidence, have kind of certainty in pointing out which of these many, many different inputs, uh, equipment, technology are likely to meet that bar. All right, another promising intervention, one that, as I said, feels very near and dear to my heart, uh, is providing community-based childcare centers. Um, as we discussed above, control of labor, especially at key planting times, harvesting times, can be a major constraint for women. They will tend to have greater care obligations, but also maybe less able to rely on household labor. And we've got one study of this, which piloted community-based childcare centers in the DRC. And it found really significant increases in women's income and control of income. One really great finding from this study also was that the cost was not as high as you might have expected. Um, it's about $16 per month per child who attended. And we find this intervention to be promising in part because kind of childcare has been studied in the context of a lot of other labor markets. So urban labor markets and labor participation for women um, there's a number of studies, much more than one, showing that that improves labor force participation, women's income, et cetera. But 
Right now, we have only the one study in a rural setting and looking at agricultural production. So we think this is promising. The theory of change certainly makes a lot of sense to me as a mother. But uh, I think it, it is a great candidate for additional research and study to understand whether it works consistently and what the costs, what the implementation conditions are. All right. And then the last of our promising interventions here is training programs to improve women's intra-household influence and role in decision making. Um, one example of this uh, that showed up in many of the studies we found was what's called the Gender Action Learning System, I think originally developed by EFAD. And that provides couples with training and reflection sessions on what household responsibilities and decision-making distribution is, and then a facilitated process of rebalancing, perhaps, um, those household responsibilities and decisions. And in practice, in the four studies that we could find, this was often being implemented by or through producers' organizations in the context of joint, so male and female um, household heads, cultivation of cash crops. There were eight impact estimates available, so it's a pretty good size of, of research on this, from studies across four countries. And this is one of those cases where we have relatively more data points, but the results were, were mixed, although positive. Um, in some cases, better cooperation between male and female partners doing joint cultivation actually led to higher household productivity itself, which was potentially surprising to me. I might have thought this is a norm shift intervention that was going to drive control of income, whereas household grants were just going to be about the dollars. In fact, we did see sometimes that this increase in cooperation and communication yields better agricultural outcomes at, you know, in a very basic way. And in many cases, less, less surprisingly, um, these kinds of trainings also increase women's share of income and decision-making power within their households. And I would say of all the interventions we reviewed, this one had the most consistent and highest um, impacts on that aspect of our outcome measurement. But the reason that this is rated as promising and not a good buy is that there was a lot of variation in that outcome. Uh, sometimes within the same country, you would see two variants of this program implemented. One would be effective and the other would not. And it wasn't for any reason that we could yet discern by reading this research. And so this is exactly a, another case, yes, I keep saying this, uh, where further research would be really useful. In this case, not to you know, begin laying down the potential of this intervention, but to really hone in on what the active ingredient is that's needed for success and what that looks like in a you know, context specific manner for this kind of general facilitated approach. Uh, I will mention that when we presented these findings uh, a little while ago at a USAID conference, we learned that USAID Malawi in coordination with the Peanut Innovation Lab and I think with funding from Irish Aid is working on a new multi-armed RCT of a program just like this. We've been collaborating with them to um, kind of unpack research questions and see how much they're going to advance our knowledge of when and why and for whom this works. And it's a wonderful example of kind of the, the two-sided nature of evidence use and evidence generation. Going through this review helped us hone the questions we would have. We can communicate directly with researchers to say, here's what we would like to know to be more confident. And now, several years from now, when, uh, when the end line results come out, we're hopeful that we'll be able to reassess and improve our confidence um, in the cost effectiveness or when or why this intervention is cost effective um, as part of this assessment. All right, and now I'm gonna turn to our unpromising buys. And a reminder, these are those which evidence suggests are less cost effective, but also where we are less confident in that extrapolation across context. These are not bad buys where we are certain they should uh, be looked at with great skepticism. All right, the first intervention in this category is using female advisors to deliver what I'll call business as usual, agricultural extension. Um, and this was a, a somewhat surprising finding. I think it seems natural to assume women farmers might learn better from other women. They could have easier transfer of information. Um, other women may face similar challenges if you're talking about kind of lead farmers who are also cultivating their own plots. 
Um, and there's the potential role for women as role models um, that you know, the psychology literature speaks to as being potentially quite potent. We found two studies on the use of women as extension agents or model farmers. And the results of these were very mixed. Um, in Mozambique, for instance, female farm advisors drove take up of new technology, but we couldn't trace that through to growth and income. And there are all of the various other constraints that can kind of eat away at potential income growth in between tech adoption and our, our kind of ultimate uh, outcome. In Malawi, interestingly, um, female farm advisors actually ended up increasing the gender gap between men and women. Uh, it seems because these female farm advisors were extremely competent and men who were exposed to them benefited and had growth in their productivity and income, but women farmers did not. And that's a wonderful paper that unpacks kind of how information flows through social networks and what some of the reasons are for that. So the conclusion that we felt we could say is basically, at best, female farm advisors are probably linked to adoption of new techniques, but not necessarily to growth in revenue and income. And there seem to be two key factors that account for this. Um, on the one hand, the social dynamics of communication kind of through women are just very, very complicated as this Malawi example shows. And so I don't think we wanna view this as simply as, if I use a woman to communicate this extension information, it will solve all of these problems. Um, kind of the, the, the network's angle, the perceptions of women in these roles is much more complex and context specific than that. But secondly, and I think this is maybe one of the bigger points that comes out across these unpromising buys, is that whether this is likely to be linked to growth in income and profits depends entirely on what is the new technology, cultivation technique, input, whatever, that women as extension agents, um, lead farmers, are being asked to model. And again, the ultimate change in income or um, profits is going to be down to what that specific new technique is being pushed. And there's still a huge amount of variation there. So the way that I would view this result is not to say like, oh, don't consider you know, using female farm advisors, just stick with the status quo. But I think the point is this is definitely not going to be a panacea. And where it's used should really be thoughtful and careful in considering what the, the role of women as communicators is gonna look like in that context, because it is not as simple as saying, women will communicate more effectively with women farmers. It's much more contingent uh, and, and context specific than that. All right, I've only got two left and then we're gonna jump, uh, t move towards our wrap up and Q and A. So I, I assume there's lots of questions building up in the meantime. Um, the next of these interventions that we found to be relatively unpromising was subsidies or finance to promote the adoption of what I've called business as usual inputs and equipment. And this is actually, we've got quite a lot of studies of this. This is a fairly common, I would say, um, approach to maybe doing gender in the ag space. It's common to try and just simply reach people, through uh, reach women, sorry, <laughs> through business as usual subsidy or finance programs. This could be things like national uh, fertilizer um, voucher scheme or subsidies, providing improved seeds. Um, and adoption of these new inputs or equipment is often promoted through subsidies or loans. We have a number of studies on this and out of eight impact estimates available, only one showed any change in household income or profits. So that is not, not uh, the size, the scale of impacts that you would hope to see, especially when you consider that we have alternatives we've reviewed, which are promising or good buys that are more routinely delivering, um, you know, kind of reliable impact on these outcome measures. Um, none of these programs were able to show any change in women's influence um, over household income. Perhaps that's, that's less unexpected. Um, the, this is not to say that these programs were having no impact. And we did absolutely see subsidies and finance driving adoption of new techniques, equipment, et cetera. 
But the point here, as I alluded to above, is what is the content of the new input technique, technology that's being encouraged? And in general, it seems that kind of simply pushing women to try to adopt gender blind ag technologies does not drive changes in income and profits because of all of those other constraints that I mentioned on information, on labor, on mobility, uh, et cetera. And so this is the flip side almost of the, uh, the promising intervention, which is about subsidizing or financing adoption of gender adapted inputs and equipment. And the really critical question here, uh, as I mentioned earlier, is how do we distinguish between these two types of um, agricultural technologies in, in a general sense? And this is an area where we think further research is really particularly needed because what this finding is suggesting is that simply kind of pushing women into existing um, kind of ag subsidy programs is not driving particularly transformative change for them. Um, further research could help identify what the barriers are that are preventing adoption from driving higher income. And it could be that some of these programs become more effective when bundled with other things. One thing I think is quite interesting though is, is the contrast between this finding and <clears throat> our finding on these unconditional household grants. And I think one possible interpretation here is that when we're choosing what we think women farmers should be investing in, what new input, what equipment, what technology, um, there are a lot of other contingencies and constraints that may be very hard to take into account from centrally planning a program. But actually just giving women the cash to make those investment decisions themselves, they may have better information than us and make those investments in a way that ultimately has a higher chance of tracing all the way through to increased income. All right, and my last one here is including women in business as usual ag extension. And this is, you're gonna see a very similar finding to what I just mentioned above. Um, it's very common to kind of add women to some of these existing programs, encourage them to enter these existing programs. Sometimes that's facilitated, for example, through um, ICT. But again, extension is often focused on encouraging adoption of improved inputs or cultivation techniques that may not have been designed with women in mind. And once again, what we saw looking at the results here is that these programs were sometimes successful at encouraging adoption of those new techniques, inputs, et cetera. But only one out of the three impact estimates we could find showed any change even in yields. So this is not to mention tracing all the way through to profits. Um, again, the story is the same as above. Ag extension can help drive adoption, but adoption of gender blind inputs or techniques is not driving big change in women's income or control of income. One important I don't know, caveat or, or point here is that this is not saying that training per se is like not a good thing to do. And you'll notice one of my promising buys up above um, this intra-household training on um, you know, gendered responsibilities and decision making. That's that's absolutely a training intervention. This may be a really important component of other things. Um, but we shouldn't assume, I think the, the evidence suggests that the, you know, we can't necessarily believe, you know, as a matter of fact, that business as usual extension is going to be focusing on its sufficiently gender adapted inputs and techniques. And so once again, this is bringing us back to this core issue. What are the new agricultural techniques, technologies, adoptions being encouraged? And are they sufficiently gender adapted that women can overcome all the different constraints or work within all the different constraints to get all the way to increased income and control of income? All right. You've listened to me talk for quite a while now. Um, this is my kind of one slide wrap up of my good promising and unpromising buys. We did not identify any clear bad buys in this space. Um, but at this point, I'd like to turn over to my colleague Asla Kess, who was our partner in crime working on this review for a discussion and then leading into our Q&A. Thank you, Caitlin. And yes, thanks for 
pulling out my, my one slide. And uh, thank you both, uh, Caitlin and Dean, for this very thought-provoking, very informative uh, presentation. And, and the recommendations are, are really uh, quite, uh, a, you know, conversation starter, and we have gotten a lot of great questions and discussion uh, going on. So I want to make sure that we have time to respond to as many of those. So uh, before we move on, uh, however, I just wanted to highlight a few takeaways that I wanted to also uh, sort of quickly discuss. Uh, and I want to sort of emphasize four points especially. Uh, first is uh, on intentionality. I think uh, as, as Caitlin was also just discussing, uh, what, we, what came out of this recommendations and this review is that business as usual approaches that, that, uh, that really do not include intentional, uh, intentional sort of interventions or, or thinking around uh, gender equality and you know, reaching women and so forth uh, do not really lead to the results that we would want to achieve through our program. So uh, rather we need to be thinking about the specific needs and preferences and roles that uh, women have within the context that we, we design and implement our programs and uh, all of which shaped incentives, the ability and the willingness of women to engage and also to benefit from the interventions. So uh, intentionality is one thing that, that came through to me very strongly and that we cannot just think about crowding in women to uh, programs that, that lack that very specific ingredient. The second uh, uh, sort of takeaway I wanna highlight is that in, in the in the promising uh, interventions bucket especially, and this was a very exciting uh, finding for me uh, particularly, is that uh, many of the interventions that sort of surfaced uh, from a women's land rights and access, expanding co-titling, community-based childcare centers, positive masculinity interventions, and intra-household decision-making, all these uh, interventions uh, actually really tackle some of this sort of the systemic challenges that women face in, in, in agriculture. So both the rules and norms that really underlie a lot of the jet or a lot of the inequities we see from, you know, inability to uh, have that time and labor allocated to maybe on-farm, off-farm economic activities to uh, tenure insecurity, which uh, drives uh, you know, incentives and, and ability to invest in new technologies to more intra-household dynamics and power relations that uh, limit women's uh, ability to control uh, income or make decisions around income and production and other economic uh, sort of uh, elements of, of, uh, of their uh, labor and, and returns. So I think these recommendations really reinforce that gender transformative programming uh, is critical to engage women, men, and communities and other system institutions and actors to tackle these systemic challenges to produce the kind of impact that this review uh, really surfaced. So, and, and again, as I think uh, Caitlin mentioned, these interventions, and I think a lot of the discussion in the, in the chat came uh, sort of pointed to this as well, are very context specific and, and sort of the norms and the, uh, the, the, the context really drives to what extent these interventions produce the results. So there's more evidence needed and more research probably will, will get us more and more nuance on, on the, the sort of the mechanisms of how these interventions work and uh, how we can maximize uh, the and sustainable and impactful results out of these interventions. Third, another topic area I think there were a lot of discussions and questions on was the lump sum cash, which were targeted to women. The ones that I think were part of the review targeted specifically women for rural investments. And again, picking up on a point that Caitlin made, the, these interventions are very straightforward and produce results, which is great, but I one, one area where we want to think more of uh, about and, and probably again, deepen our understanding through 
additional research is is sort of the bundling aspects. I think again, some of the conversations online uh, pointed to this that uh, whether or not women, you know, the, the the normative context, whether or not women are able to fully control the income or other constraints that they may have to more effectively invest and get returns from this lump sum cash, whether it's about uh, you know, building their entrepreneurial skills or linking them to markets may in fact build on this what is a very sort of you know good buy and and actually expand on on the impact of the program. So what what that bundling is and what aspects of it may may really reinforce the the positive impacts of this intervention, I think again is dependent on on context and constraints women face, uh, but but a very uh, a great, I think, starting point to think about how to use this mechanism, this approach to, to really expand impact. And uh, I think talking about uh, all these, which sort of came out many times over, is that we, de we do need more research and evidence and synthesis. We do, uh, I think, Kathleen mentioned the number of uh, sort of studies that underlie these this, this synthesis and, and recommendations. And I don't want to go too much into it, but I think again in the Q and A, uh, we discussed the geographic distribution of the studies and how generalizable things are. And I'll let Caitlin and Dean respond to some of those questions. Uh, but what you know, walking away from this very helpful and very insightful uh, study uh, was that we just need to uh, really build out the evidence base for for not looking at this one outcome also, the women's income and decision making, but many other outcomes we would like to see more more robust evidence and and direction on how do we uh, on 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 prioritizing interventions. So I will stop here and want to go and start looking at the questions we received and there were many and and uh, really, have the rest of our time, which is about 15 minutes, uh, respond to those questions. And I see Dean just jumped on camera as well. And I think maybe we can start with the, some of the questions on, on the methodology and cost effectiveness analyses and, and um, related uh, inquiries. So Dean, one of the questions that came early was on um, was sort of maybe directed to you, and it asked if comparative cost effectiveness analysis is used to if comparative cost effectiveness analysis is used prior to program design. What kind of impact analysis should be used for program monitoring and evaluation? Is monitoring costs, outputs, and implementation fidelity enough? Uh, when should we collect data on outcomes and use experimental design? Over Hi. to you. Sure, great. Thanks for the question. The, the the short answer is this really think about the two by two that we talked that we that we kind of shared with the the confidence in the evidence. So the basic question is, is the theory of change well enough validated that there's that there's you know solid confidence that as long as there's implementation fidelity, um, the you know outcomes will will you know will 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 be there. If that's the case, then no, you don't do an impact evaluation. You just track the outputs and the, the implementation fidelity and you stop. Um, you track outputs specifically when you have a counterfactual and you can attribute a change in that outcome to your program in terms of impact. And if you can't do that, then odds are high that, that collecting data on outcomes is wasting money and worse yet, leading to misguided conclusions and inferences. Um, and so very much the emphasis we have and, you know, and there are some, you know, exceptions, which would, you know, I think in a more detailed conversation could get into, but it's really quite rare when, when the desire is to measure impact, then you want outcomes when it's just to measure implementation fidelity, then one should be measuring outputs um, and, you know, immediate, immediate process changes. Um, while I'm on, I can go ahead and answer the one other one. Yes, I was just going to, to ask to, you to kind of to... reduce the transition time. Um, there's a question on sustainability questions that that was flagged for me. Um, I want to ask the question is I want to ask how sustainability of intervention impacts is being integrated into cost effectiveness analysis. For example, do the targeted 
cash subsidies result in sustained income increases. This is this is entirely embedded in what we mean by an outcome. That, that outcome that you're targeting, that could be short run, could be long run, could be a combination thereof and net present value, that is entirely baked in to the definition of the outcome, the sustainability question. And sometimes you dial in for cost effectiveness thinking about short run. Um, sometimes maybe the data are richer and so you're focused on the short run in terms of the data and the studies that you're able to use. Um, but um, other times long run and, you know, so that, but that is entirely baked in and, and, is, and, and integrated into what we mean by an outcome and that incorporates timing into that. Uh, thank you, Dean. Uh, and I will now switch it to another sort of, I think, set of questions that sort of got to the same, same sort of uh, point. And Caitlin, maybe you can take this one. And uh, it had to do with the fact that many of the studies, the, the synthesis included, are uh, from Sub-Saharan Africa. And uh, so it's a number of questions asked about the general generalizability of the results given the geographic focus. And also given the fact that, again, the normative context and, and how households function and how income is managed within households differ between South Africa, I mean, from, from Africa to, to Asia. Uh, could you speak to, to the sample and, and the generalizability question? Basically? Absolutely. And I think this is a really fantastic and important question. We're doing a number of these impact reviews um, across sectors in the coming months and years. and. Uh, this is not the first time that we'll have to think about this, nor the last. Um, I think the key here is to unpack the idea of generalizability and move it from a question of, you know, what country was this done in to what are the intrinsic features of the intervention being tested and the theory of change that would or would not apply across contexts. So um, perhaps one of the simplest ones is, you know, access to inputs or uh, financing or, or, you know, kind of grants to do things is, is a common feature of agriculture around the world. What credit markets and finance may look like is different place to place, but I think that is likely to be an important feature. And so I think you can take some um, intuition across contexts there. That's not to say the intervention itself should be applied cookie cutter style. As Dean said at the beginning, even when we identify a good buy, the subsequent step is to say what made it a good buy in the context in which it was studied, and then do those same mechanisms, delivery channels, et cetera, apply in the place that I'm thinking about. Um, I think that that leads you to kind of a sense of some, I don't know, there's kind of a a distribution of generalizability among these interventions and those that rely on kind of mechanisms or delivery channels that are really, really context specific. If we're talking about um, social norms change, there's going to be a lot higher bar and a lot more inquiry needed kind of qualitative foundational work to do some of that transportation. Um, the kind of Amusingly simplistic example here is the, the consistency of the findings about these unconditional grants. There's other studies, not just from ag, but generally, you find that if you give people money to invest, they can invest it. And that's a lot less contingent, not, not zero, you still need to think about it very hard, but there is, you don't need a full, you know, um, context analysis, you know, site specific gender analysis, et cetera, to believe that that might be necessary. So I, I, I would actually suggest we don't think about generalizability per se, but you take it on an intervention by intervention basis and say, what would I need to believe to believe that these results from these settings applied over here? And then use your knowledge of the, um, the context to assess if you, if you think that's true. Great. Thank you, Caitlin. And uh, maybe one quick question to you as well, as we sort of maybe start diving into the specific recommendations and discussions on those. Uh, and that was uh, to you, uh, directed to you and asked, could you explain how women's income in family farming systems is commonly measured or is household income used as a proxy for women's income? Oh, what a good question. Um, 
this is one case where you really, there is a variety of methods across the studies that we included. It's not um, the case that you have a single universally used measure. I will say we generally did not use household income as a proxy for women's income unless there was a separate measure of women's control of income available. Um, the hard part about this, and I think this is I think I maybe saw that Agnes um, Kusenbig was, was potentially on the line. Um, I, I read a number of her papers. They were really illuminating about this. The point that um, a lot of the early research on this topic focused on women-headed households because then women's income is super easy and straightforward to define. But that's actually a, a small minority of the women farmers that we care about. And in many cases, we need to focus on women in situations of joint or shared cultivation, at which point women's income, if it's literally two people working the same plot, becomes a lot harder to define. Um, so there's not a simple answer that says it was always measured this way. I will say we didn't take household income as a proxy unless there was a complementary measure of women's control of income available. And in part, that accounts for why we have only three studies in this review because that level of granularity is not as commonly available as we would like. Um, I will flag some of the more recent studies in this space have really fantastically rich and in-depth measurements of revenue separate from costs, separate from labor going in, and who is incurring each of those and all of that. So some really wonderful examples maybe we can share in a follow-up that, that we think are, are great measurement that others could learn from. Great. Uh, so maybe going into the specific recommendations a bit deeper, one question uh, came on uh, the use of women female advisors to help increase uptake new technologies. And the question asks, when we say that female adv advisors help in increase the uptake of new technology by women farmers, can't we link that to increase in the yield or income? So this was... Um, a recommendation, or I'm sorry, an intervention for which we had only two studies. So this is not one where we have super high confidence. And these studies were um, mixed in their results. This was my uh, Mozambique and Malawi study. Um, in one case, it was associated, if I'm remembering my slides correctly, with an increase in adoption, and I believe in revenue. In the other case, it actually increased the gender gap because women's income uh, stayed the same and men's grew. So it is not universally necessarily um, associated with that. And I think this is a great case where um, this question of generalizability or context specific mechanisms is especially important. Um, another you know, finding consistent with all the research I know about women in economics, how women are perceived as bearers of information is hugely context specific and much more complicated than you might imagine. So it's not the case that that is necessarily true. It seems to be true sometimes, but not others. And from, from two studies, we couldn't say exactly when or why. Thank you, Caitlin. There are a lot of great questions. I'm having a hard time <laughs> picking ones. And then as Catherine mentioned at the beginning, we will uh, try to answer questions that go unanswered today or after the event. Uh, but uh, maybe a question to both of you, Dean and Caitlin, and, and maybe Caitlin, you can take it first uh, or Dean. Uh, and that sort of is a broad question. Uh, how does USAID ensure it will, it really wouldn't be overall, oh, sorry. How can we, how can, how does USAID ensure it really wouldn't be overall more cost effective and impactful to focus on women and men equally, appreciating fully all the arguments and rationale for positive focus on women? Uh, I think that really goes to the heart of what we do today. So Dean, would you like to take that question? Sure, I, I, I really love this question. It gets it gets to the heart of what we're doing. Yeah. Um, so I, I, have, I have a two part answer for you. First is to say, we're not asking this question um, because by definition, cost effectiveness asks how we get the biggest bang for our buck to move a specific development outcome for a specific population. And so in a sense, you're asking a cost benefit question, not a cost effectiveness one. And 
when you you know stay within the lines of 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 the spe you know specific development outcome for a specific population, um, in a sense that's you might say ducking that question entirely, but I think it's not ducking. It's actually um, recognizing that there's you know these questions across sectors, across areas, across populations is a, a kind of different calculation. And what we're really aiming to do is to embrace the priorities that are set for whatever reason they're set, and then figure out how to how to move the needle as much as we can. Okay, well, my second answer will 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 directly answer your question. <laughs> Um, and say, if we were to go down the cost benefit path, my philosophy is to start where the market failures and injustices are worse, where freedoms, and I mean that broadly as social, political, and economic freedoms are most restricted, where the problem is deeper, the benefits from improving them are the most. So, of course, they may also be the hardest to move, but all the more important to work on it. And, and to, you know, to kind of bring it back to the theme of the past 90 minutes, to use evidence to find out what is actually working. And um, and so we know that women have less freedom, less freedom socially, politically, economically, and that's the the case to be made. Um, and why why the emphasis? Thanks, Dean. And Caitlin, I don't know if you want to add to and the kid to Dean's answer, but there are also a few questions on 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 fidelity of implementation and uh, the, the sort of the how RCTs. Um, and, and cost-effective analysis, uh, you know, what are the potential ways to build on that uh, to, to really uh, sort of nuance the evidence in, 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 in working in gender with all the systemic challenges and normative, uh, you know, uh, context. So uh, I'm not going to read all the questions because that takes time, but um, maybe you can take over and answer. Absolutely. Yeah, there were three questions about fidelity of implementation. I know we're about to be out of time. I did really want to address this one because I think it it gets at the heart of how to interpret the findings from this review. Um, as people noted, um, the interventions as we've bucketed them may include a lot of variation. Ag extension looks really different in different places. Um, even if you had quite a consistent model, GALS is a appro you know, an approach, it has its own acronym, but it's implemented in different ways and potentially with different um, quality across studies. And could the results we're seeing be potentially driven by that fidelity of implementation and the variation? And I would say the answer is basically yes, and that's really important. Um, the flip side of this question is sometimes people say when you see really good results, like, oh, well, that was just... That was an RCT, it was a pilot, it got so much attention um, and that's why it was so good. My question would be if even in these fairly high profile cases where models are being implemented, they probably have additional m &E support, et cetera, we're still not seeing results. What does that say about general programming of this type? And at some level, I'm actually very, very interested not in how interventions perform under ideal um, circumstances, what you know, the medical field would call an efficacy estimate, but a real effectiveness estimate. What does it look like on average when we throw this thing out into the field? Um, and this is part of why I described these kind of unconditional household grants as a hard to screw up intervention. There's something for which fidelity of implementation is actually relatively straightforward. And when people are doing program design, making these decisions, they're making a risk reward trade-off here. You can go really, really deep. You can do highly context-specific analysis, diagnostics, et cetera. But you are facing a, a choice between alternatives, some of which rely on that incredibly close, specific context-based design, and others of which rely on it to a lesser extent. This is back to the generalizability point that I made earlier. And so I, I would urge people not to think about cost effectiveness in terms of the results of how interventions perform under idealized conditions, because we don't implement in idealized conditions. We implement in the real world. And that's my favorite thing, I, honestly, about doing these studies and why we spend so much time documenting what actually gets delivered here. So we're not just studying mechanisms, we're studying what actually happens and what the returns, the results, the effects are from that kind of programming. So it absolutely does influence the results here in a way that I think is like good and important and really worth focusing on. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Caitlin. We have just about a minute left. So I just want to pass uh, the mic to Alejandro Valencia, our Senior Knowledge Management and Organizational Learning Advisor for a last word. And in doing that, I want to thank both Dean and Caitlin for the presentation again, and for everybody for a wonderful uh, conversation online and questions. Over to you, Alejandro. Thank you so much. And uh, I just wanted to thank everyone for, I mean, the presenters, Caitlin, Dean, uh, also Asli for um, helping us facilitate. Um, then also for all the participants and your questions, as mentioned before, those questions that didn't get answered are going to be answered in a document that we will also share out. Uh, we will send out the recording as well, as, as I know some people have been asking. Uh, so please continue to share um, uh, your opportunities, tools, and blogs on AgriLinks. Continue to go to, on AgriLinks. I know that this theme month has been full of blogs and, and interesting posts. And with that, uh, thanks again, um, and we'll see you next time.